Hello, my name is Horkon and welcome back to my channel and uh, another update on my Synth DIY project. Uh, it's been a few days since last time I made a video about this. Uh, what I'm doing in this series is I am trying to expand the possibilities of my phenol synth with attenuators, with an interface to use with my landscape stereo field and an interface that is MIDI to CV, that was a DIY project. Um, and there are one, two, three, um, four things maybe I want to show you today that are new since my last episode. Let's start with the first things first. So this was the, this is the poster board material that I'm now intending to try to use for my front panels. Um, all that, of course, does hinge on one particular thing, and that is that I can create holes in this more easily than I can through plywood. Um, and for that purpose, I got these. These are steel hole punches. Um, but there is, of course, a small problem with these, um, which I can get past, but I'll just talk over it a little bit. So for each of these, there's, um, they've got a certain size marking on them, it says six millimeters here, uh, and that is the inside diameter of the cutting edge. Now, the way these have been machined, as you can see, perhaps, it sort of tapers inwards, and then it tapers even more inwards, and that's your cutting edge. Um, but problem one, they have not been sharpened, they've only been machined, so the fronts are not sharp at all. A uh, second problem, which is related really, is that they don't actually take sharpening so well. I did try to sharpen one of these, and while it got sharper, it didn't get super sharp. Uh, it's, it's just the nature of the steel that's been used, it doesn't take a keen edge. And um, because of the shape, I mean, that's all fine and well if you're cutting through something that is um, soft, that will move out of the way as you push the punch through like leather. So you get a hole that's the size of the front, but then everything else just gets pushed out of the way. If you do that on this kind of cardboard, on the other hand, when you push this all the way to the bottom now, you have a hole that is this sort of shape, it's bowl shaped, and it's going to be smaller at the bottom than at the top. Um, which means the actual hole size is technically going to be bigger if, if the punch goes more than all the way through, which it can do. Um, so that's another thing. Um, and lastly, of course, because, because they're not sharp, these are quite hard to use and, and of course one of the reasons it's hard to use it on this material is that this is first of all it's like one sheet of paper on one side one sheet of paper on the other side and then in the middle there is a three layer kind of board it feels like uh, the kind of consistency I would expect from a three layer board um, <clears throat> it's and of course the outsides are quite thin and so it's hard to punch through, actually. Um, so with a mallet, of course, it would be easier with a bigger mallet, but just for illustrations purposes now. Um, so if I do it like this. You can see I've not gone all the way through. I made a good indent, though, and I can sort of do like that. It gets a little bit rough, but... Uh, I can do that and then get rid of the excess on the back. Um, <clears throat> and it's still quite nice and neat compared to drilling in cheap quality plywood. But um, I did notice when I was trying these out that, in fact, they cut better instead of if you not, don't punch them down, but if you rotate them into the indent that you start making with... Uh, the hammer, as you can see there, now it's actually gone all the way through the way it's supposed to. Um, and if I'm not sure if you can see this now, but there's a sort of a bowl shape to the hole there. So it's bigger at the top, smaller at the bottom. 
Right, so, um, if rotating these is better than hammering them, um, then it did occur to me that I can actually use a drill, because many of these will fit in a drill. So, let's see if that's, um, let's do one that will fit easily now, without too much... Plus, let's see... Try to get it centered now. There we are. Okay. So, if I put it in a drill, you can see a drill is quite, it's very easy for it to stay centered because unlike a normal drill that starts from the middle and moves out, uh, this one starts in the circle, so it's already sort of self-centering um, in a way. I think that's, that's almost through. Because now the, the background here is quite rigid. Even though it's a cutting mat. There we are. Maybe all the way through. And a bit into the mat as well. So <clears throat> we can get quite a nice, neat hole like that. Um, but now you see the hole is actually bigger at the bottom than at the, and the first one I made. And this is the same punch. So it's very hard to be consistent from one to the next. So I've decided I will punch all the way through when I use these. Um, so I will use something like uh, like this. This is just a little block I had lying around, so it's got a hole in it, so that I can... So when I use these hole punches, I go all the way through. Like so. Of course, now I went a little bit too far, <laughs> and I made a huge mess of it. But uh, that's the principle of it. I'm going to use something with a, with a more shallow hole, I suppose. Um, <clears throat> Because that's the only way I can get a consistent hole exactly the same size every time. Uh, and it still works fine with these. Um, of course, if you want to, to use hole punches uh, and actually get a consistent punch uh, in the normal fashion, you need a, a hole punching machine, sort of with a lever, lever action uh, kind of machine, uh, for instance. Uh, and also... I also realized, just excuse me one moment if I can find it now. For smaller holes that are closer to the edge, I've actually also got this one. This is a good old fashioned leather hole punch. And this is, well, I can actually get quite far into it as well, uh, like so. And uh, this is actually quite good, uh, and this works really well. Um, and another thing, of course, when you don't just use the front to create the hole, but you push through, you get a little crater on the back, like so. Not a big issue, of course, and it can be flattened uh, as well by hammering or pushing something something hard onto it, um, like so, and then I just uh, punch through again, just to even it out, like so, and there we have. So I did really messed up the front there, so don't, don't look at the front, but that's the, the principle is what we are after. Um, and of course that extra thickness at the back there is not going to be an issue because of uh, this cardboard being relatively thin to start with. Um, so, but of course, if you if you want a proper quality punch like this, I mean, we can't expect much from a set of this price. This cost about 11 pounds, I think, or 12 pounds. And the thing is, if you want a good quality sharp and punch that can be sharpened as well, um, you are looking at probably um, at least 12 pounds per punch rather than £12 for a set of punches. So these are costing a fraction of the price of the real quality deal. But because I can use them in a drill, I can work around this. Um, now there's one thing, of course, about that, and, and it's not a major thing. Um, the biggest size I will need, which is about 11 millimeters, that's about there, I think, um, will not fit in my current drill, and of course it's not technically a drill even this, I'm using a um, an impact driver as a drill, which is not ideal. 
uh, I have ordered now a new drill um, because I will make my life easier and also it will be less wobbly than this thing is. This one is going to be fine just for very simple drilling tasks when I've already got my impact driver out, uh, like drilling holes, pilot holes, for screws and things like that. Right, so that's one thing. So the punches are good to go, really. Uh, I just had to find the right way of using them, which is drilling um, and not punching. And it works really well, I would say. So, in conclusion, it is going to be easier to create good, consistent, clean holes in this material than it is in the plywood. Get that out of the way now. Okay. <clears throat> Second thing uh, today. Oh, hang on. Oh, suddenly stepped on some plastic. Right. Second thing uh, that is new is that I've got my Eurorack rail. Uh, so here it is. This is a standard. Um, I forget now. Is it fifty six HP? Uh, rail, which is technically a little bit wider than the phenol, but this is sort of the size that I could find that was um, the right, at least the right size. And um, so it's going to be um, a little bit wider in the middle than at the top and bottom. My uh, the rack I'm making for my uh, phenol, but that'll be okay. I'll, I'll sort of, of course, I'll I'll pad in so that the whole rack is going to be the full width. Um, and then I will have some extra room on the sides of my phenols to, I don't know, I'll, I'll think of something maybe I'll, I'll put there eventually. Um, so this is a nice rack, aluminium, uh, not too expensive. It's got the uh, mounting holes that move, which is quite useful if you want to uh, be, um, shift things around a little bit to make them just perfect. So I quite prefer that to the static rails. Um, even so, of course, my mounting holes on my panels will be exactly right as if the rails were static as well. Um, another thing I noticed here is that I actually got a little bit extra space top and bottom a few millimeters so I can make my modules a few millimeters taller uh, uh, to look nicer uh, on the rails. And also that means my mounting holes will be a little bit further away from the edge which is always a good thing. Um, so that's the rails. <clears throat> Third thing is I've started thinking about how to create my rack uh, or my, my stand. Uh, so just to run you through quickly now what I've been thinking about. So my first thought was I, well there needs to be a certain angle between the Euro rack rail and the phenol based on the fact that there are going to be plugs and cables sticking out of the back of the phenol. And that angle is about this. Um, I can't remember the exact number now. Uh, and then I decided that I would put the Euro rack in the same alignment as the second phenol up here, uh, rather than having an angle between them. And the reason is that this angle was such that to make it look nice, if I added another angle there, um, it would look nicest if that's the same angle, uh, but that would look would be almost a 90 degree um, yeah, It wouldn't I don't think it would look that nice actually So I pre quite prefer the look of this where the euro rack and the second phenol comes in one line and I can do that because the front of the phenol doesn't have any connections of course um, And then the first phenol down here, and I think that's a good working angle um, I could make it a little bit lower the whole thing, but I think this is very close to what I would consider ideal. And then I have been considering whether to have an extendable foot uh, to go out at the back uh, to support it so it doesn't tilt over. Uh, but then I did look at this and of course there's going to be as much weight, there's going to be more weight here in front than at the back really. If you push it at the top here. Um, you will have to push it back by this much before it even starts tilting properly. So it will, and even then the tilting point for the whole 
thing would be quite far back. It would have to push it, I think, about maybe this this far. We oh, can't even see it on the paper here now. Uh, so 20 centimeters, something like that, before it would even start tilting properly backwards. I think I'll be fine, but um, I can, of course, retrofit something like this later, a sort of a lockable and extendable foot. I was thinking maybe having a handle for carrying because it will be quite heavy with two phenols on it um, in addition to all the wood of course. And, um, and then I was thinking whether there should be a one piece of side of wood on the side, a single piece. I'm not sure if I have anything that's wide enough um, because I need a 40 centimeter um, piece of wood. I do have something I think might be big enough. Um, if not, I could make it as a two piece. So this is one piece and this is one piece, which would also allow me to take the phenol and use it on its own, just one of them, um, as uh, which I sometimes might want to do. Uh, then I would need some kind of mechanism for very securely locking these two pieces together. I'm not sure how I do that, but I'll think of something. Um, and that is the status of my idea for the actual stand. It's getting closer to the day that I can start making this now because I have started tidying my garage. There is actually already uh, pretty much room for me to work now, uh, although I would like to tidy a bit more first. Uh, and also I do want to do this on warmer days than what we've got at the moment. And that brings us very neatly um, Onto the last thing, which is a cup of tea. <laughs> no, just kidding. Um, my midi muso. So, if you remember, this is going to be my sort of main uh, midi to actually. There's two parts, really. I'll just bring the other one as well now. Uh, if I can find it. So this is going to be. I have changed it a little bit from this design, but not much. Um, so, actually I can talk about the changes now. Um, I have decided to remove the LED on switch. Um, I'm thinking for the gates here, I'll just leave the LEDs on always. Uh, I'll try that anyway, and if I'm, if I'm not happy with that, I'll, I'll add a switch, because that is very easy. I'll just make sure they all share the same ground connection, so it's easy to put in the switch. Um, so I'm going to remove the LED on switch and I'm going to move the clock output over here. Um, another reason for that is of course that all these, the gates and the clock, they're actually all on the same uh, pin header on the MIDI Muso, so it makes sense to have them together. Uh, and then I'm going to include the pitch shift, the pitch bend um, parameter output here. Even though I'm not going to use it with a Zoya, it did occur to me that I am going to use it if I'm using the instrument, for instance, as a controller, um, in which case I may want to use it. And so I will include pitch bend here. Uh, and that means that these ones are all on two headers on the Mini Muso as well. And then I got all the trim pots down here as uh, the plan was. Now. Um, because these trim pots that I'm using down here, they're all panel, no, they're not, not panel, they're not panel mount, they are um, circuit board mount, so they don't have any attachment with a, a washer and a, and, a, and a nut to attach them to the panel itself. Uh, so I had to create a little circuit board for them, uh, and then uh, I just kept going. So these are then the circuit board mounted trimmer pots um, that are wired up and while I was at it I started wiring so first I wired the um, all the ground connections that's the yellow ones here all these yellow ones sticking out on the side um, and then I wired the outputs which go up here and the inputs from the pin headers uh, making sure I got them all in the right place. And then I decided I might as well just create a sort of a prototype to check this out. So I just did quickly did some holes here in a, in a piece of card um, and put on the numbers for the different channels. Uh, I can't test pitch bend right now. I can test that it works though. Um, and at the moment, after wiring this up and doing some tests, I think there were channels 171 and 94 were not behaving. 
So there is some short circuit to ground, I suspect, but I'll have a look at that. All the other ones are actually working fine. I tested them yesterday. Um, I'll show you the back as well here. Um, so all the banana jacks, of course, are with these solder lug things. And really, these are really cheaper banana jacks, by the way. The solder lugs, they come with these, um, these things that uh, you bolt on with the nut here. Um, they don't take solder very easily at all, so you have to work at it quite a bit. And even when you clean them, uh, I think I'll have to use uh, something like steel wool or sandpaper on them to actually make them accept the solder more easily. Uh, so it's a bit bit of a hassle. Um, and then, uh, so the way these are soldered up, I'll just this might be easy to show on the front here. So, because um, these are all going to be uh, voltage reduction potentiometers, uh, voltage divider potentiometers, I should say. So that means we have uh, from the front here, the leg on, on this side is the, hang on, I was saying it right now because I'm, I'm always thinking about this. Yes, yeah, so uh, the leg on this side is the ground. The leg in the middle of the potentiometers is the output going up here. And the leg on the right is the one from the input. And then the potentiometer just acts as a voltage divider so that you can use the whole range of voltage coming out. What I've done furthermore, by the way, to this MIDI Muso is I've tuned it. So uh, you can see down here there's a trimmer pot. And if you set it just right, your output will be one volt per octave, which is what most synthesizers use. Um, and I adjusted it so that it is so close to one volt per octave that by all purposes, uh, by all intents and purposes, it will be in tune. Um, which means that if I want to use this as a pitch output, uh, I just put it fully open so that the whole voltage comes through. Uh, so that's the potentiometer all the way to the right. Um, and then I get an output, uh, a maximum output of 10.5 volts, I think, is about the voltage I get out, um, which is quite high. So I have to be a bit careful when I put that into the, uh, the phenol. Um, and then if I put it halfway down, it's about 5 volts, and all the way down, it's 0 volts, of course. Um, um, this works really well. Um, so I can use this trimmer pot to decide what kind of voltage range I want my MIDI signals to control. And then I use a MIDI controller like the Zoya to send those signals. Now, another issue I have with this, of course, um, and one I hadn't thought about before I started this project, is that um, this is the pure MIDI voltage output. There is no slew limiter. And by slew limiter, I mean <clears throat> if you go from one value to another, uh, is it smoothed out? Uh, and it isn't. Uh, so that by default now, without adding, adding any other circuitry, every time you, if you have, certainly if you have high voltage for your MIDI, uh, when you move it from one value to the next, like say from 124 to 125, there's going to be quite a notable stepping, um, unless it's really quick. Um, if it's a really fast movement through values, uh, it will be relatively smooth, but it's sort of got a sort of a rough edge to it because it's not going to be completely smooth. It's still going to be a stepped curve. So it's like uh, like a stair. If you see, if you saw the curve on the on an oscilloscope, it would be like a st stairs rather than like a smooth smooth wave. Um, that's not necessarily a problem. It can be quite a nice sound and goes really well with the phenol. Um, but I will look into how to make a slew limiter because it would be interesting for me to know and um, it might be nice to have the option of smoothing out some of these things as well as we go along. Um, for instance, um, I could sort of envision having a separate slew limiter uh, module so we have an input and an output and a slew amount um, potentiometer. And then you maybe have a set of four or five of those. And that would probably do me uh, for whatever I would want to use it for. 
Uh, so that's something I will have to look into at some point. But for now, it's going to be slightly stepped MIDI, but it's going to be MIDI and it's going to be loads of MIDI, which is brilliant. I tried it with LFOs, I tried it with uh, sending pitches, I tried it with uh, sending um, ADSR uh, envelopes, which of course is one of the things that I've triggered my interest in MIDI controllers to start with because I wanted to use more ADSR envelopes. Um, and yeah, uh, another thing, by the way, I'm, I'm not using um, none of these um, MIDI outputs are currently set to pitch output. Um, and that's the reason is I'm, I'm mostly going to control it with the Zoya. But then it occurred to me that actually sometimes I am going to control it with uh, the instrument. Uh, and if I do control it with the instrument, I would have to change the mode so that um, I go into one that allows me to have one pitch output. So what I would do is um, I would change the mode of the MIDI Muso, which I can with uh, program change messages on the Zoya. And then the CC4 here would act as a pitch output. And also on the gate module here, the first gate would act as a gate output for that pitch. So it's quite simple to adapt to that. I mean, you just have to make sure you remember to switch the modes back when you don't need them anymore. Um, right, I think that's about it. Um, uh, I would have demonstrated this for you now, but I think this video is long enough. Uh, and I will leave that for another episode after I've done some troubleshooting to find out what's happening with these three channels that aren't working. But of course, as you can see with this kind of soldering and on this kind of panel, the potential for things to go wrong is quite high. It's not exactly a printed circuit board. Um, although uh, this kind of design here makes me think that it would be nice uh, one of these days to have a look and see if I can actually make printed circuit boards for some of these. Uh, particularly this one really is the one that really needs it the most um, that would benefit from it because it would be so much easier to solder first of all and secondly it would be so much more reliable as well um right so that is the status of my project at the moment um i still haven't printed my new front panels on this material because i still wanted to uh, try it out a bit more with the punches before i started doing that um, and i have tried it now with the punches and i'm quite happy with it so i will go ahead and do that. Uh, so my plan now is I'm going to print out the panels. Uh, although first of all, there's one thing I need to do first of all, and that is to make sure that I um, know exactly what hole sizes to create for each different thing. Uh, that's the one thing. And then uh, once that is done, I'll have to modify all my... So instead of the picture of the component here, there would be uh, just the hole. Uh, marked out in the correct size and then I print them out and then I varnish them with PVA glue leave them to dry punch the holes cut them out and add the components in this case I'll just transfer the components it's going to be brilliant okay so thank you very much for watching please like share comment subscribe uh, if you found this inspirational or interesting and I will see you again next time with more synth DIY or something else so Goodbye for now. Bye-bye.